Okay, we're going to take a look at uh, Empire of the Sun, created by Mark Herman and produced by GMT Games in 2005. Now, I've had this game for a few years, but have never really given it the attention it deserves. And um, although this isn't a formal review of the game, we're just going to look at the pieces and the cards and just get, give you an idea of what the game is about. This is becoming one of my favorite games. Um, I don't give the title Masterpiece to too many games, but in my opinion, this is one of them. The only other game I give Masterpiece status to is the old Avalon Hill Republic of Rome. But uh, this game is a very good one. Um, it's certainly not an introductory game. If you're trying to get someone into wargaming as their first game, I wouldn't start them off with Empire of the Sun. But let's take a look at um, some of the pieces and get an idea of what the game is all about. Now I have to mention the map by Mark Simonich. Um, in a few words, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's one of the best Pacific War game uh, maps I've ever seen. And uh, we'll look uh, a little bit closer at the map in a minute or two. Now what I've got set up here is the 1942 scenario. Um, I do that because I, I don't know, I don't think you can improve much on the Pearl Harbor attack. And uh, I kind of prefer the 42 opening. There's a little bit more for the Allies to do. But let's um, take a closer look at the map and the various um, charts that are on it. Well, since the war began really at uh, Pearl Harbor, I'll show you the Pearl Harbor front and of course uh, Midway to the west. And over there is Wake Island and we've got the Marshall Islands. And there's the Philippines. Now I must point out that the scenario that I've set up is the 1942 scenario. It's uh, kind of where I want to uh, study the game. Um, there is, of course, the campaign scenario starting in 1941, but um, I'm interested in the 1942 scenario prior to the Battle of Midway. We'll go over there to French Indochina. You can see the Malaya Peninsula and with the British Army there at Singapore. You can see the um, Sumatra and Java. The orange units, by the way, are uh, Dutch regiments. And we've got Australia over there. We'll whip up to the China front, Burma. Chinese units are in red. And we've got the British based there, the SEAC headquarters at Calcutta. And we've got the Exeter cruiser squadron there at Colombo. We've got your replacement chart there. As you can see, the Japanese get very precious, precious little in the way of um, replacements. You've got your strategic track there, where you're going to be recording various kinds of information, like the American political will, the amphibious um, shipping used by both sides, and uh, Japanese resources as they capture them from the Allies. Now, the resource hexes, by the way, are these um, hexes that have like the little oil rigs in them. So, these are quite important for the Japanese. These are these are generally the strategic objectives they're going to be wanting want to capture. The ones with the little oil rigs. Okay, and we'll take a look at these tracks here. You've got your, your game uh, record track, pretty standard. Each turn representing what? About four months. You've got the political will track, which is very important to the game. The um, Japanese are trying to get this political will marker down to zero. The Allies, of course, are trying to have it go the other way. And the War in Europe track, which is really important. Mark has designed the whole War in Europe um, subsystem, which affects the Pacific War to a large degree. And, of course, you've got your terrain effects chart. The terrain is mainly, you know, we've got open jungle, mixed mountain, ocean atolls, ocean coastal. Um, you've got your J Chinese government front status marker. The war in China is very much part of this game, although a sub part of the game. You've got the Burma Road status and the status of India, which these are all affected by cards. And you've got a track showing the Japanese divisions in China. Mark is trying to show that the war in China is very much, are very important and certainly affects the Pacific War. And that whole China war is a 
it's a subsystem within the system itself. Let's take a look at the counters. Okay, since the war opened there, why don't we take a look at the uh, Pearl Harbor uh, hex first. And this is the, like I said, the 1942 scenario. Well, that's a headquarters counter, uh, Central Pacific. You can see the first number is quite large, 25. That represents the range at which the headquarters can influence and activate units. The second number is its efficiency rating. The higher the number, uh, the better the headquarters rating is. And there we have a core size unit, the American 10th Corps. The um, 18 is its attack factor. And the 12 represents um, uh, a more complex number. Uh, let me look at the rules to see what that exactly represents. Okay, well it's less complex than I thought. It actually, it represents the defense number. Uh, but in this game, it essentially represents the number of steps that will be taken um, for losses on the table. Here we've got the 7th Air Force. The first number represents uh, the combat value, the 10 the defense value for taking step losses, and the 2 represents its range. Uh, but the 4 above it in white represents its extended range. Certain uh, air units have extended range while others do not. Now here's what I like, of course, the Navy. Uh, the larger counters are the naval units. And these are nice looking. You've got the Enterprise, Lexington, and the New Orleans, which is flipped. Now each um, naval counter uh, represents about uh, two to four ships, I believe. I think carriers represent two ships, and some of the cruiser divisions represent four. And uh, that makes sense because most of the times these cruisers and stuff traveled uh, in formations and in groups anyway. So Lexington um, represents probably uh, two of the Lexington class carriers. When a carrier is flipped, uh, try to think of it as being one out of commission or one being um, uh, one sunk, I guess. Um, so anyway, that's the naval counters. Let's take a look at some of the others. Okay, we better take a look at the Australians. Here's a, an Australian Corps, an Australian air unit. Same information as the other unit we looked at, except this four, as you noted, is bracketed, which means it's limited in um, combat um, situations. And there we have the heavy cruiser uh, Kent Division. So that's the Australians, brown with yellow centers. Okay, the Dutch are represented in the game, as they must be they were important in the opening phases. The uh, Dutch units are kind of an orangey and they are only regimental size so they're gonna have a heck of a time against uh, Japanese brigades and corps. You're only gonna be able to buy time with them uh, and the Dutch, which the Dutch did. I mean um, when you read about the feats of Admiral Dorman and his taking on the Japanese with his light cruiser squadron it's it's kind of sad, the Battle of the Java Sea and stuff. So the Dutch do get naval units, and there's a division size unit too in Java. So the uh, with the Dutch, um, well, you're going to try to do the best you can. Um, over here, uh, well, you've got Singapore, of course. You've got the British Army with the Malayan headquarters and uh, some um, air units. Now the brown with the brown center are Indian units, part of the Commonwealth nations. And you've got up there um, the Exeter Cruiser Division at Colombo and SEAC headquarters at Calcutta with more Indian units and more Allied air units. Now I think they've misdeployed the Chinese up there, but the Chinese are um, red units. Those are army size units. Like I said, I don't think these are set up right. I have to check the uh, setup for the scenario. Again, another Indian unit there. 12-12. Now let's take a look at the, um, well, one of my favorite, the Imperial Japanese Navy. It's really cool. You've got the Battleship Division, Congo, the Akagi, the Shikaku, the Soryu, and of course you've got Army units there in Tokyo. Um, you've got the Battleship Nagato, which I think was the flagship. You've got the Battleship Yamato, and it starts flipped in the 42 scenario. That's because its sister ship, the Masashi, was not completed. But when you see, uh, when the Masashi is completed, you'll see the Yamato division is not something to be laughed at. It's quite a formidable unit. So that's um, a brief look at the counters.
Uh, they're very nicely done, uh, as is the map. I think the whole game just looks beautiful. Let's take a look at some of the cards. Okay, now I sleeved my cards. I don't do that with all my CDG games, but this one I thought deserved it. I decided to uh, use the clear sleeves so I can see both sides. Now, that has its own set of problems because when you sleeve the cards, they're a devil to um, sort. They're a little bit harder to sort. And when you get a huge stack of cards, they slide all over the place. They become kind of unmanageable. So I just went to a, a solution store and got one of these uh, office solutions. If you put your sleeved cards in here, uh, they're not going to be a, a sliding mess on you. Um, well, let's take a look at some of the individual cards. Um, I don't remember what Mark said about the um, decks itself in some of his articles. I don't know if he calls this game scripted or semi-scripted. I'm not sure. But you do have two distinct decks, the Japanese and the Allied. So the Japanese, of course, is always drawing from his deck, and the Allied player is always drawing from his deck. I believe Paths of Glory has the same idea. Let's take a couple of look, uh, look at a couple of cards. Okay, apologies for my little bird PT there. I guess he's curious as to what I'm doing with this game out. Anyway, there's um, a typical card. Uh, this is a political card. You can tell that by the yellow band. Plus it says political on it. And in most, uh, as in most CDG games, the um, cards can be used for their operations value here. The number in the upper left. Uh, ranging from 1 to 3. 3 being better than 1. Or you can play it for the uh, event. And... There's a reaction card. You can tell blue indicates reaction. There's its ops value, and of course, there's the uh, conditions under which you use the card. And there's the black military card, operation value three, and again, you can use it for the um, um, for the event. Um, the IA1 operation. Um, I remember Mark uh, remarking in one of his articles that this is a very important card. Um, um, which you should use for the event, but you can use it for the ops too. Uh, Operation Z, which simulates the attack on Pearl Harbor. If you're playing the um, entire campaign game, this is the card the Japanese would open the war with. Now there's a resource card. They're green. This usually mean, mean you get replacements or reinforcements. So all of the um, cards are color-coded. There's another political card showing you the war in Europe, and that would move the war in Europe uh, marker a number of spaces in favor of the Japanese. So let's just go through and quickly get another. Um, I have to resort these, I think. There's a military card. Yeah, okay, here's a good example. Now, one of the neat things about this game is when you play an offensive, the um, attack is assumed to be surprise attack unless your opposing player can change the intelligence level. And he can do this in two ways. He can play a reaction card which changes the intelligence level to intercept, or he can roll for it. And that's why these two numbers are here. If the player had used it, operations card three, uh, he, the other player would have to roll a five or less to change the attack from surprise to intercept. And under certain conditions, you can actually change the card from, or the attack from surprise to ambush, which is um, kind of simulating the midway operation. The Japanese goes in with what he believes is a surprise attack. You get a lucky die roll or a, a good card, and you change it to ambush, which means you inflict losses on the enemy before his attack goes through. So this is a really neat part of the game. It really stimulates the... Um, intelligence conditions in, in World War II. And uh, the cards are all rated for these intelligence values too. Now there's a mine of cards in the game. We won't go through every one. That's just to give you an idea of some of the Japanese cards. Okay, we'll look at a few allied cards. I'll, I'll make a generic statement about the cards themselves. They've got a neat World War II feel to them. There's always usually, or usually a black and white photograph associated with the card. And that brings a lot of period feel to it. Um, there's a green resource card. There's a political card, War in Europe again. Um, Operation Cartwheel. 
military cards. I might point out something about the titles of the cards because um, I had to ask this question at WBC. I think uh, Mark thought it was kind of interesting because I have a different design philosophy uh, on the way cards work. But the titles of the cards don't always necessarily relate to the geography. Uh, Mark's game is much more open. So when you're thinking of uh, Operation Cartwheel here, breaking the Bismarck barrier, it doesn't mean it has to be used just in the Bismarck um, area, anything like that. The cards are wide open. The, the titles of the cards are already uh, to give it period feel. Now, War in Europe, of course, does affect the War in Europe, and it's in red to indicate that. Operation Stalemate. Invasion of Peleliu and Ulithi. Again, um, doesn't mean you have to just invade Peleliu and Ulithi. You can invade anywhere within the context of the text of the cards. So you must always read the text of the cards in a Mark Herman game. They're very, very important. Mark Arthur invades uh, Luzon. Again, you're going to have advantages perhaps by invading Luzon by reading the text. But um, use the title of the card just as a guide to the way the card works. There's one of my favorite ones. I love these submarine attack cards. A uh, political card. Another military card. Another military card. I love these black and white photographs. And uh, another political card. So that gives you an idea of what some of the um, allied cards are like. Now, in a short introductory video, it would be hopeless to try to um, explain in detail how the game works. Even at WBC, uh, Mark gives a one-hour tutorial on the game, and he, even he um, concentrates pretty well on the offensive phase, which is the uh, meat and potatoes of the game, you might say. How the game works on a, on a war game level, interacting with the cards, moving the men, and having combat. That's the meat of the game, is the offensive phase. But the reinforcement phase, the political phase, attrition phase, these are all very important too. And the rules booklet is at, uh, how many pages are we talking here? I think it's about, well, 48 pages total. A lot of them are, are charts and there's examples of play. But we'll say overall about 30 pages of uh, of rules to learn. This is not an easy game, certainly not an introductory game. I'm still learning it and um, other people have been playing it since it came out and um, are, are experts at it. They can now talk strategy. Well I can just talk, hey, learning the game. Uh, what else can I say about the game? I really don't know what else I can say about the game except I like it. Um, it's just one of the best War in the Pacific games I've played. I have tried Victory in the Pacific, Avalon Hill, a very good game designed by Richard Hamlin, uh, but a simple game. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to go back to that kind of game after trying trying this. It would be almost like, I just had a steak, I just can't go back to, you know, a McDonald's burger kind of thing. And I'm not denigrating Victory in the Pacific. It's a fine game. Uh, it's a very popular tournament at WBC. It has its aficionados. It's it's just a, a great game. This I put on at a whole different level. This is teaching me the Pacific War on a level I never really quite grasped before. So um, those are my final words on Empire of the Sun. Uh, by GMT. The game is out of print now and it's back on the P500 uh, run. Um, whether it'll be reprinted anytime soon I don't know. I'm hanging on to my copy. I think Empire of the Sun could easily become one of my favorite games and as I said I rate it um, at the masterpiece level. Um, if you're interested in the War in the Pacific at all this probably is your cup of tea. So um, that's it for Empire of the Sun. Thank you for watching.